I want to talk about how sound waves interact when you combine sounds, like putting together voices and mixing in some instruments or even making a chord on a keyboard. There are two reasons for this. One's practical, that as you add more sounds in a mix, you increase the overall volume level, the decibel level, and you do need to watch that as you create these things. And it's not so critical because it's pretty easy to watch the volume level down here in the VU meter, the volume unit meter, and just make adjustments to the overall output just to compensate as you add more tracks to a multi-track mix. So, you know, the practical side is relatively simple, but I do want to show you how that works. And then on the sort of academic side, I want to show you how sound waves look when you start combining sounds together. I think it's just kind of a cool little thing just to get a sense of how that all works. So if you want to follow along with this demonstration, feel free to open up these two multi-track sessions by going File, Open, go to the multi-track session subfolder of working files and open up the 0203 setup and Sounds Interact multi-track sessions. Let me just show you just a brief demonstration of what I mean by all this. I'm going to go to this organ chords file by double clicking on it and just play a little part of it here and watch the view meter as we add more notes. At first, it'll jump pretty dramatically when you add a second and a third note, but then it'll kind of settle down because the organ can only put out so much power. There you go. So we're combining those notes together into a chord, and you can see the view meter starts off relatively low and then jumps and then kind of settles down because that's basically as loud as the organ can get no matter how many notes are pressed. And that's just something to keep in mind as you combine notes in a chord or combine voices and instruments in a multi-track mix. Let me show you some of the theory behind this. We'll go over to this little presentation here. So how do sound waves interact? Well, so-called in-phase waves are additive. That means if you have waves that are exactly equal like this, the bottom of the wave will combine with the bottom of the other wave to make the dip even larger. And then the top of the wave will combine with the top of the next wave and make the peak even higher. So you double the overall amplitude when you combine those two things together. And that's important to know that, although you will rarely encounter two files that are exactly in phase and exactly additive. But that's just the way it works. They add together. Out of phase waves cancel each other out. So if you see that the dip of one matches the rise of the other, they add together to be zero. Basically, if you think of a dip as being a negative number and the rise as being a positive number, you have those two guys together, you get zero. And you won't encounter exactly out of phase waves in the real world, but that's just kind of how it works. It's this kind of waveform that you will encounter. Varying phases combined in complex waves. If you look at that one peak there in the right hand side, that big blue peak, the blue peak next to it, or the red peak down below it, combines together to make a bigger peak in that purple wave to the right. So when they add together if they're both going up and then they kind of work against each other when one's going up and one's going down. So that's how waves interact. So back here in Audition, let's just take a look at that. I'm going to first of all go to this little session where sounds interact. I've got two files here. I've got a Tone 440 and an inverted Tone 440. The Tone is this familiar A440 we've been listening to. So let's listen to this one here and mute to this one down here. You've heard that a million times. But this one down here is an inverted version of that one. Let me just show you what that means. If I take a look at this original Tone, look at the waveform view, you'll see that it starts by going up and then down and then back up again. If I look at the inverted one, it starts by going down. Let me just zoom in on it just so you can see how that looks. It starts by going down and then up and then down. And I created this simply by taking this tone and going to the effects and using the invert effect. So I've got two guys and they will now cancel each other out. You'll see that as a very practical thing here. I've got these two guys together now. What happens if I play them together? Silence. Even though you can see they both have sound associated with them, they are canceling each other out. Those two waves are exactly opposite and create silence. Who'd have thought, right? If I can fix that, I can go back to this little inverted tone here. And I can trim away this drop and have it do exactly what the other tone does. The other tone starts by going up. So I can just trim away this thing and have it where it's just it's going up right there at that little crossing point and just delete that. So now I'm going to get this message saying, by the way, you're changing something that's in a multi-track session. Is this okay? And I say, yeah, it's okay in this case. It's fine. So now it's going up as well. If I go back to that multi-track session, they're going to play fine. I get this little exclamation point by the saying, you've made a change, which is fine. We'll just dismiss that. Here we go. And now they combine. Remember the first one, I'll just solo the first one. The first one playing by itself at a volume level of minus 18 dBFS, meaning 18 decibels below the full scale. If I combine the two of them now, 
going to leave minus 12. It adds 6 dB to the overall mix. So when you combine two things, it increases the overall volume. But there you go. It's the inverted thing versus the original one. Let me show you what happens if you combine octaves. Let me go up to the octave version thing. I've got uh, this tone octaves. Double click on that. Let me just play this for you. It goes down octaves at the beginning. So notice as I add it, the volume level goes up a little bit here each time. And we'll talk about the volume level a bit more. But what I want to show you is what happens when you combine notes, where you take one octave and combine an octave with it. Here's the original octave at 440, which is 440 cycles per second. And then I add something that is half the number of cycles per second. It's 220 cycles per second. Let me zoom in on that. You can see what's going on a little better. In the space of two cycles here, I have one cycle in the one that I added to it. So what happens is two peaks now per wave, if you want to think of it that way. Here there's one peak per wave, and now when I add two things together where they're exactly octaves, it's two peaks per wave. If I go over to the next place where I add one more note, it goes from the two peak wave, and now I add another note down below that, which is the width of two of these guys. And when I add that one note, now a full wave is going to have four little peaks to it. And this is because these octaves are combining in this additive fashion that you saw there in that PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to go right to the end when I've combined eight notes. You can see how complex it gets now. If I zoom in on this, this is one phrase there that starts here and goes to there. So now we have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 128 peaks in that one full wave because of all these octaves that have been combined. I love how math and music are so closely related. Here we have an A440 again. Now that should be familiar to you. That is a major chord. And major chords have this wonderful mathematical relationship. It's such a comfortable sound for folks who are raised in the Western music. It's just so natural, but in fact, it's mathematically based. So it's sort of the beauty of it is that the math is so beautiful and that relates to how we respond to this music. The fundamental of this chord in all major chords, you just pick whatever the fundamentals, whatever note that is. In this particular case, it's A, so it's 440 cycles per second. The next note up in the major chord is what's called the major third. And that is mathematically 25% more than the fundamentals. So if it's 440, 25% more than 440 is 550, and there's the 550 line right there. Here's a major third. And then the next note up is a perfect fifth, and perfect fifth is 50% more than the root, than the fundamental note, which again, just, I love how the math works. It's so clean. 25, 50. There we go. And then to finish the entire chord, we're going to put the octave up here, and an octave is exactly double the fundamental, so 440 doubled is 880. Now watch how the volume levels change with each added note. You start at minus 21, and the volume changes by 6. It goes from minus 21 to 15, so that's by 6. The next one, though, just goes by 3 decibels, and the next one just goes by 2. That's because all these guys are adding together, and there are places where the waveforms are falling, and where they're going up, and they combine together, and they don't always add smoothly across every note, particularly as it gets more complex. So how does this translate to something like real world, like voices. I'm going to take these four voices here. This is a studio session where the vocalist, Laura Lee Christensen, recorded her part four times so she could create four-part harmony with herself. So here's the first part, and then you'll hear each one added later. Just too hard to find. You're just too hard to find. Just too hard to find. Just too hard to find. Okay, so each time in the mix that I created, I took one voice, then a second voice, then a third and a fourth. So what happens the first time? The first time, the volume level's right around minus 15. Next time, the volume level's right around minus 6 or so. So that's a big change. That's a pretty dramatic drop. Nine decibels or increase in volume. The next one, though, is basically the same, even though it's a third voice. And the next one... It's also basically the same, even though it's a fourth voice. So the fact that we start combining things, when you take one instrument or one voice and add another instrument or voice, you're going to increase the volume pretty dramatically. But you add the third and the fourth, it doesn't go up that much.
But would things be different if you did this in a stereo pan? So let me just go with the last thing here. I've taken those four voices, took the first one in the center, put the second one hard left, the third one hard right, and the fourth one in the center. And does that change the overall volume level relative to when they're all in the center? Let's take a look here. Just too hard to find. That won't be different, but... You're just too hard to find. That one's in the left, so you can see that it brings up just the left channel with a little bit of the right channel going up. Just too hard to find. Just too hard to find. So the answer is, even though they're put into a stereo pan, even though they're spread out left and right, the overall volume level stays about the same or equals what it would be if they were all panned to the center. So just be aware of that as you build these sessions as well. So that's just a basic look at what happens when you combine sounds inside Adobe Audition you know, in terms of the decibel level, the volume level, and in terms of how those waveforms interact.